Welcome to day two of Blog Her 14. We have an incredible lineup this morning on the future of the social web. What do we need to know as creatives ourselves, independent creatives, from experts who are running platforms, leading massive content organizations, and commentating on the space about our futures in the social web. We're gonna kick off this morning with two 10 by 10s, starting with Barb Dubois. Barb Dubois is a veteran and a blogger OG, original gangster, for sure. When we started this crazy idea in 2005, she was on our advisory board. Today, she's currently the head of business development for top uh, tech destinations in Gadget, Joystick, and Tua for AOL Tech. It's very hard to shake a stick in the tech content industry without finding a site that Barb has helped build. Um, I, the list is too long to really go into it, but she was one of the founding editors of Weblogs Inc., help build in, in Gadget, and has written innumerable blogs as well as helping explain tech to sites like usatoday.com, and she's also a frequent commentator on Yahoo. Somehow she finds time to be a musician and appreciate funny pictures of cats. Please welcome Barb. Bloggers. Who's awake out there? <laughs> and who partied last night? <laughs> Clearly not the same people. <laughs> it's awesome to be here, and as someone who spoke at the very first blogger way back in the ancient times of 2005, it's very hard to believe we're having a 10-year anniversary already. I'm humbled to be here and be able to share the stage with such an amazing crew of women. And I'm excited to get a chance to nerd out a little bit with you in this session and talk a little bit about how developments on the hardware side of the house have really gone hand in hand with the changes that we've seen in the media landscape. Plus take a little bit of a look into what the future of technology holds. I have Elisa to thank for this photo from Blogger 2007. At the time, I had transitioned out of a role as senior editor at Engadget, one of the biggest tech blogs on the planet, to run our sister site, Joystick, about video games for AOL, who had acquired us as Weblogs Inc. in 2005. Gina Trapani on the left was the founding editor of Lifehacker before going on to found ThinkUp with Anil Dash. And Annalie Niewitz on the right was just about to launch the popular sci-fi blog io9 for Gawker. As the first wave of professional bloggers, we were never actually allowed to be physically separated from our laptops, as <laughs> this photo clearly illustrates. And certainly not much has changed about that over the past decade, but what has changed is that blogging has grown up. We're even more constantly connected by an even greater proliferation of devices that are smaller, thinner, and lighter than what we were carting around back then. But those heady days of exuberance over the democratization of publishing brought about by tools like movable type, blogger, and live journal to becoming the de facto digital content strategy for a huge collection of the world's top brands. We were suddenly able to go from thought to publish posts in a fraction of the time that we were able to do so in print, and we didn't have to convince any gatekeepers that those thoughts were worth sharing. Back then, the discussion centered on how to find and connect with our communities of interest, whereas 10 years on in the media world, it tends to be much more about amassing a huge audience of eyeballs and monetizing the hell out of them. I'm not trying to imply that all the fun has gone out of blogging. After all, we do live in the age of BuzzFeed listicles and infinitely scrolling cat gifs. But even the job of peddling top 29 cats in sweaters has become serious business. <laughs> We've also seen somewhat of a shift away from the classic long form structure of blogging to a world of microblogging, social media, and the status update. When the first blogger was underway, Facebook had just received its initial round of funding and was still only open to Harvard students. Twitter was just a, an internal project at Odeo, which was a podcast company. Friendster was already conceding Mindshare to MySpace, 
which was acquired by News Corp that same month of July 2005, and went on to host pretty much everyone's garish, blinking profile until Mark Zuckerberg's behemoth eclipsed it in traffic in April 2008. Flickr has given way to Instagram, unless you're asking Marissa Meyer. The paper resume has been supplanted by LinkedIn, and pretty much every other blog on the planet seems to be redesigning its interface to look more like Pinterest. A great deal of that social shift has to do with the ubiquity of mobile devices, which allow us to carry our social graphs around with us everywhere we go, in our pockets. At the inaugural blogger event in 2005, I led a session on mobile blogging. Now, almost none of those tools are still in use today, but pretty much every blog platform on the planet has either an app and or is responsibly designed to work equally well on a computer, smartphone, or tablet. Smartphone sales passed computer sales back in 2011, and total sales of mobile devices this year are on track to top 2.4 billion with a B. It took us until 2012 to reach 1 billion smartphone users on Earth, and we're on track to double that already by next year. And besides the shift from feature phone to smartphone, an entirely new class of mobile device hit the market and grew explosively. The tablet was literally the stuff of sci-fi until Steve Jobs showed us we needed one in 2010 and left other consumer electronics companies scrambling to catch up with Apple. Now Samsung seems to make them in Android flavors at literally any possible screen size you could ever want. And these little slabs of flat touchscreen ushered in an entirely new lean back experience for consuming all the proliferation of new content and really paved the way for magazine-like aggregation experiences like Flipboard, Pulse, Paper, and others. And one of the many other ways we spend our time leaning back with a tablet is by watching video. And the amount of content available to choose from now is truly staggering. What blogging did for publishing, YouTube did for video. It democratized access, provided a platform where a universe of new stars has been birthed and exploded the long tail of available channels for us to choose from. Today, 100 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every single minute, and six billion hours are watched per month, about one for every person on the planet. And beyond having an overwhelming number of options about what to watch, we also have an explosion of new choices about what to watch them on. Whether it's running an actual operating system or hooked up to a collection of internet-connected boxes, chances are your television is a lot more intelligent than it was 10 years ago. It runs apps, it streams your music collection, it gives you what you want to watch on your own time instead of broadcaster's time, and it probably even lets you post to Facebook and Twitter. Now let's start shifting our view to look forward a bit. What are the trends emerging now that have the potential to shape the next 10 years of connected life. Wearable technology is certainly among them. How many of you are wearing a fitness tracking device right now? Fitbit, Nike Fuel Band, Jawbone Up. That's, that's quite a few. This category really kicked things off in a way that people can understand. We all want to know what's going on with our health. Most of us could use a little extra motivation in our fitness habits. And these devices piggyback on what we already do by wearing jewelry or wearing something on the wrist, which is exactly where the next emerging category of wearables resides, with consumer electronics companies pushing the smartwatch category very hard right now. Samsung, LG, and Motorola are all releasing new devices this summer, and Google has built a version of Android specifically for smartwatches. And speaking of Google and wearables, we're over a year into the Google Glass experiment now, but it's pretty difficult to call that one a success story just yet. <laughs> Arguably the more interesting story on your face right now is in virtual reality. And this slide shows one of my favorite scenes from CES earlier this year. The device is the Oculus Rift, which was one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns of 2012. It raised over $2.4 million and went on to be acquired by Facebook earlier this year for $2 billion. 
Now that's basically chump change for Mark Zuckerberg, but it represents a big bet on the future of VR technology, which was originally envisioned as a way to make gaming more immersive, but is poised to disrupt a number of industries from entertainment more broadly, to medicine and healthcare, defense, real estate, product design, and undoubtedly a number of others we can't even imagine yet. And while wearables is the splashier trend with fancy fitness trackers and cyborg looking gamers, a slightly less sexy trend is already well underway. But the internet of things is poised to be an even bigger business than smartphones, tablets, PCs, and wearables combined. Now sensors and internet connected chips are small and cheap enough to be embedded in almost anything from light bulbs to coffee cups. Your thermostat knows what temperature you like. Your fridge can text you to remind you to pick up some milk on the way home. Your toaster can tweet you when it's browned your bread. There are about 2 billion connected devices out there today, and that number is projected to grow to 9 billion by 2018. And in terms of dollars, the overall market could reach as much as 7 trillion with a T by 2020. And what the internet did for media and software and YouTube did for video, 3D printing is poised to do for physical objects. You can rapidly generate a prototype before investing big dollars in a new idea, unleash an endless well of creativity from the comfort of your own home, and deliver products on demand instead of making expensive inventory bets. And on top of churning out lovely little plastic pink bunnies like these, 3D printing technology can actually create a surprising array of things, from food and chocolate, including pizza for astronauts in space, to clothing, musical instruments, cars, parts for spaceships, which NASA prints along with that tasty pizza, drones, guns, one of the more controversial items, other 3D printers for the inception lovers among you, and even human tissue and body parts. Yet another disruptive force we're all familiar with now is crowdfunding, which is democratizing access to capital, much as blogging did for publishing. You can start a new media empire with the support of a community of backers without having to skulk around Sand Hill Road or take a product to market the conventional wisdom keeps telling you isn't going to work. Equity crowdfunding is poised to change the rules of the game even further, giving average non-millionaire citizens the ability to invest in early stage startups in a way the current SEC rules do not allow. So where do we go from here? And what does the next decade of technology have in store for us? It seems like we're heading inexorably toward a world of ever-increasing speed and connectivity, a constant proliferation of devices in our homes, our workplaces, and soon, our bodies. But we're already collectively feeling the strain of being always on, incessantly pinging, being pinged, or worrying about missing a more important ping somewhere else. And the pressures of life and work across a hyper-connected planet that seems to demand more and more of our attention, more and more of the time. I think this is one of the, our greatest challenges for the next 10 years. How will we find the balance between our drive to engage and interconnect and technologize and our very human needs for tranquility, solitude, and unhurriedness? Will we find a place for measured reason and longitudinal thinking amidst all the pinging, blinking, and tweeting? Will we learn to value the slow in addition to the fast? That choice lies with us, and we have a responsibility not to shy away from it. Thank you.